Welcome to the truth in this art. I am your host, Rob Lee, and you'll have to bear with me. It'll make sense soon. I am super excited to welcome my next guest. They are the director of the screenwriting and animation SWAN program at Morgan State University. He has an impressive track record of success in the field of marketing communication and uh, corporate film and video production in Los Angeles as well as serving as an in-house producer for several Fortune 250 companies. Um, so without much further ado, please welcome my guest, Keith Mellinger, to the podcast. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, Rob. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for, uh, for making the time. I mean, this is, this is months in the making. You know, I'm happy that we're here now and um, able to kind of chat a little bit. I feel like the... The real podcast is the conversation we had before getting to the official podcast. <laughs> so before we get too deep into like these questions and all of that, um, could you share like your, your story and what was your sort of like first experience with like creativity with the cinematic arts, whether it was there was a movie that you really dug and you're like, I'm going to do something in that field one day. Or was there a piece of art that you were like, that's really great. What's something that sticks out for you when you were a young person? I'm a child of the 50s and 60s, so my parents went to movies. And my father had been in World War II in Europe for an extended period of time. But he liked um, both American film and he liked foreign films or international films. So my parents would take me to the movies and, um, you know, it had a great impact on me. And... Sometimes my father would go to see a film like Three Coins in the Fountains with my mother, or Three Coins in the Fountain, or let's say the Nuremberg Trials, you know. And on the other hand, he would go see Fellini films, you know. And um, so I had this contrast and um, uh, at home um, and on TV, we had um, Ben Hunter's Million Dollar movie it was a it was a regular kind of you know um uh place to go see hollywood films of course broken up by commercials but uh and then i lived in in pasadena altadena california so there was always filmmaking going on production trucks everywhere all the time and some of my family friends our family friends were actually in the industry so it was um it, it was it was all around us, but I fell in love with uh, storytelling, probably from cartoons as much as I did from uh, actual movies. And I used to go to the movies, take the bus to the movies by myself or with my friends. And, yeah. and um, you know, I've always had this love of, of film. Yeah. Um, I, I think about you talk about going to see like movies with your friends and, and things of that nature. And cartoons are just near and dear to my heart. Uh, I remember there were opportunities where I was like, hey, be a part of this like uh, program. I was like, S is it on the hours of 6 to 11 on a Saturday? Because I won't be a part of that. X-Men is on at 10, don't you know? <laughs> um, and even the movie thing, I, I, you, know, is, you know, I guess I'll get in trouble for, in, from uh, movie court with this, but uh, I remember fondly back in high school that I would... Um, go to like maybe East Point or something and I'll go to one of my friends. We'd pay for a movie, but we were sneaking like two other movies afterwards. So we're just, that was like my bulk period of absorbing movies. And I, I look back, I watch a lot of horror movies and I look back at going there and seeing Jason X and it was terrible. And I was like, this is not good, but that's, I'm going to remember that from that time. You know what I mean? Like that sticks out. Like I've seen a lot of movies of varying degrees in terms of like quality, but it's like, that's going to stick out because I saw that movie in theaters. It wasn't good, but I stayed for it. And it's something that just kind of pops of maybe I could do this or maybe kind of developing taste. I guess I kind of feel that it was like developing taste, I suppose. So, you know, in, in terms of going into like sort of the industry, what was like maybe your first job and talk about, talk about that a little bit, like, you know, that start off point. I, I grew up in a very, uh, 
a science-based community, and uh, aerospace was one of the main industries at the time I was growing up, and I've always loved aircraft and spacecraft and science. And actually, uh, some of my first jobs were with Bell and Howe Research Labs as, you know, a lab um, assistant, and later on with Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And um, nothing to do with film yet, but at Bell and Howe, because I was working for them, I was able to purchase 8 millimeter equipment at a discount because they made the movie cameras. Perks. And, the <laughs> Perks. <laughs> and that was one of the, the incentives for me to work for Bell and Howe. And it was just, you know, these are basically summer positions, you know. But, um, yeah, um, I, um, you know, I, um, I went to, uh, I, uh, I was shooting still photography in junior high and high school, like we all were at that time. And, and everything, uh, was, was basically, you know, required real film. You bought your stock. He developed it in a dark room. And that was part of our basic education at the time, just like music. Yeah. Um, um, we, the first time I got my hands on a camera actually was when I bought my eight millimeter camera from working at Bell and Howe and I started shooting with that. And I bought a little editor and all that kind of thing. I didn't go far with that. Um, um, it wasn't like I was shooting my movies like Steel Spielberg was, you know, recreating these, um, you know, basically staged and scripted, you know, little, um, you know, um, small cinematic, um, experiences, short films and later longer films. But I did shoot some short films and, um, uh, you know, but I didn't really get into, uh, film as a hands-on sort of practice until I went to journalism school at the University of California, Berkeley. And the funny thing is I didn't get in to the practice through journal, the journalism program. I got into it through architecture because the architecture program had taken advantage of these new technologies. And we're talking about very primitive video as compared to now. And, um, the, uh, video camera, video editing was used as a way to survey communities and to tell little stories about the people in those communities as you were doing urban planning. And those early cameras were so sensitive that if you pointed them at a hot light too long or the sun, your, your, your camera would actually get a burn in it and to burn it off. You had to fully expose your camera. It's like you're burning layers of, oh, wow. of, 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 of it, of this sensitive, you know, light sensitive, um, um, covering, uh, that's part of obviously the, the, the way the camera works. You're burning it off to even it out <laughs> so you don't have hot spots. Yeah. But that's where I really got my hands on, um, um, you know, video, uh, for the first time. They weren't using film so much. They were using video. Mm. And um, um, that was a great experience. And uh, I guess a lot of people don't know this, but early on when, when these early stages of video, you actually cut video like you did film, mm -hmm. you know, and you kind of pasted it together. And So uh, once I was at Berkeley and I'd gone through the, the journalism program, I knew I didn't want to be a reporter. Yeah. I was totally like, you know, going to be moving toward film at that point. And I had involved myself in various groups in Oakland and Berkeley who were making these little films. And it was just what I really liked doing, yeah. you know? So, and, and thank you, because there's a, there's a bullet point that goes under there, I think, um, that definitely dovetails very well to that. Um yeah, when I was talking with your uh, with some of the students within the program earlier, which was really cool. Uh, it's cool to really get the tour, got the grand tour, guys. Uh, and I, I mentioned that you know I've been doing this for a while before getting to this point, and I think I have a sense of what what my voice is creatively, but also kind of further refining that and polishing that. You know, I always joke about any jerk with a microphone thinks they're a podcaster. So I think it's about finding one's voice, whether it be through storytelling or how they go about it. 
what was that point where you found your voice in this industry? Like, you know, from, from that point, hearing architecture within the background, hearing journalism within the background and those not quite, quite being for you or your, your things, but it's still baked in from an experience standpoint. So how did you find your sort of voice and what was it like finding that voice as a, as a person within the film industry? Well, it's interesting because I, um, I was accepted into the UCLA film program yeah. and to the MFA screenwriting program. And I am out of that LA rebellion era. So, you know, I was there with people like Charles Burnett, Julie Dash, you know, and so on and so forth, who were just, you know, groundbreaking filmmakers, um, from that period. And LA rebellion isn't necessarily a name that we, we, that appropriately describes what was going on. It was just people trying to tell stories and to be, how should I say, um, um, to recharacterize the way that stories were told in dominant Hollywood film. Yeah. Uh, that featured African Americans, you know. And, um, um, it was, you know, some people refer to one of the periods which was kind of there when I was in school as black exploitation. And I don't necessarily like that name because a lot of people were working mm -hmm. and they were getting work and able to work on their craft. Right. So, you know, I mean, uh, yeah. And, and, and I got to tell you, I used to, those films were coming out in 69 and 70. They were first breaking through. And, um, I love those, those films because it was the first time we saw people resisting in ways that were violent. Yeah. With funky ass music in the background. And we loved that. We loved it. I remember piling into a car to go see Shaft, you know, um, you know, more than a few times to go see anything with Pam Greer. You know what I mean? I mean, so, so and we had a black theater in Pasadena. Yeah. I'm, I'm going back and forth because I would be at Berkeley and obviously I'd come home for the summer or I'd, or I'd stay up there. But we had a black movie theater in Pasadena called Cinema 21 and they just ran, you know, chain ran these films that we all liked and threw in some kung fu for spice, you know what I mean? That's what we loved all that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, in fact, um, um, so Five Fingers of Death was a real popular oh, film. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> integrated with all this, this, this what this so-called black exploitation. But the fact of the matter is, is that after I returned to LA from Berkeley and I was in film school, I was working for the UCLA Film Center. I got married for the first time at 21 and, um, for the first time. And, um, 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 the UCLA Film Center had some Academy Award winning documentarians who were part of the staff. So I was working as an assistant to these guys okay. and we were just shooting film, yeah. 16 millimeter, 35 millimeter. And I was taking various jobs on, on different films that I could get hired on as a PA or anything I could do. I was even driving, I was delivering film stock to the lab, you know what I mean? That kind of thing. So what happened was once I was going through that divorce, I needed more income than those jobs, that job could produce at the UCLA Media Center, for instance. And um, a friend of mine said, there's this big company called Northrop. And you should apply for this writing job they have over there. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll check it out. It was as a, a, um, a proposal engineer. And the reason why I applied for the job is because I'd gotten word on the street that Northrop had more film equipment <laughs> than some studios yeah. had. And, Need my fix. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and I said, well, that's not the department I'm interviewing for. So I went through this ridiculous interview process. I'll never forget it. They put me in a room, a magnet, a room that uh, was magnetized, the whole room. And they gave, set up this uh, scenario which General was coming and they completely messed up, put this, took everything that was to present it to him and messed it up so it was out of order. Yeah. And I had to go in there and put, things in order and write a brief presentation. And then I had to do another writing test, but there were seven people reviewing me and, um, I got the job. Okay. After I, I performed these various, you know, writing vets. And, um, so once I got the job, they told me, um, okay, we know you're at UCLA film school. You can use tuition reimbursement. We will pay, you know, we'll take care of that. You just pay taxes on it. 
And I said, oh, man. And this is what I didn't realize at the time. Uh, it wasn't important to me, but you, I got stock, too, you yeah. know, stock options, you know. So anyway, and the job, by the way, are you ready for this? Please. $1,000 a month. That was, Oof. that was, that was enough to, at that time, that was 78, I think, or yeah. something like that, you know? But anyway, um, um, so once I got in there, I, I was about to leave after a year and they really liked my work. You know, being a proposal engineer, you're working on design proposals. So you get a book out of the proposal. You're working with a graphics department to integrate the photos and everything else. You're rushing to the airport with a team to get the, the proposals, which weigh about a thousand pounds onto the planes to get it to Washington in time. It could be those are those days. Everything now is, of course, you know. You, you, know, you do everything on a computer, but you still have deadlines. Yeah. So I was when I was getting ready to leave. Um, uh, one of the big, you know, bosses said, "Hey, we want you." And I'd met the guys in the film department. They really liked me. They knew I was at film school. Yeah. Of course, they didn't have any African Americans in the department. And I was the only African American, pretty much in in the proposal department as well. Um, so anyway, they offered me a gig as a producer, writer, director, and. Um, I said yes, and um, I went over there, and um, I worked with uh, guys who were World War II vets who had actually been cameramen in the war. I worked with um, uh, some cats who had gone to USC and UCLA, uh, USC dominantly, though, but um, it was uh, obvious that many of these guys didn't think I had paid my dues to be there. You know, some guys had been in Vietnam, even, you know, as camera people. But, um, um, I made a lot of friends over time. Um, um, there were some experiences that I got through and that I handled, you as, know, as, as one should, as one should. <laughs> and, um, and some of those guys to this day are my friends, you know, yeah. longtime friends. But I was at, um, Northrop. I started with, uh, training films and I had to do the corporate overview. Um, in those days, you brought people into a big theater to see corporate, oh, to see the corporate overview at that time. And it was all slide based. You had these excellent, beautiful, you know, photography. We had professional photographers who were just at the top of their game. And everything had to be programmed in slides with music and, and narration. And, um, I did that show and eventually, and I was doing training films, you know. I, I mean, like you wouldn't believe. It. I started with the T thirty eight, went to the F five, and eventually, of course, I moved into marketing, more of a marketing role with the F eighteen. And the F twenty was a plane that was flying off with Lockheed planes to see what would be the next generation fighter. So I got into a role where I was around the stuff I liked the most. Was, yeah. I love working around aircraft and the roar of all that, and. um uh, my best product was when I worked on, um, films dealing with the F-18, which was flown by the Marines and Marines are, you know, they, they are, you know, different kind of flyers over the shoulder, you know? And so, um, I also did a film, which my, I show my students, um, and I work with the Mr. Northrop, the original Mr. The actual John K. <laughs> Northrop. So anyway, there's a film that's about the restoration of the N3B. It was the first aircraft that Northrop ever made, and it was recovered in Reykjavik, Iceland, and it was rebuilt. So that film is online, and I showed it to my students, and they can't believe it. It's like I came out of that era of, you know, the the Voice of God films, you know, with the 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 uh, documentary that's obviously shot on film that looks faded to them now, but. Um, it, it, it was just the, I had a blast working around aircraft and eventually, um, F-18, B-2, all that stuff. And of course, you know, you're constantly going through these clearances and everything. And so my friends used to joke with me, can you, can you let me know when the FBI is coming around to ask questions about it? <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 but I didn't expect to work in that world, but at UCLA, and and also just from my family upbringing, when you have an opportunity, um, you go for it. Because at the time I was in film school, the shows that black writers could, for instance, uh, submit work for, uh, you know, you know, spec scripts, mm -hmm. White Shadow, mm -hmm. Webster, Jefferson's, 
do, uh, you know, good times. Yeah. A, a handful of, and when you compare it to what's going on today, it's just really, it's, it's kind of day. pathetic, you know. <laughs> and of course, you could spec out uh, feature films, but there wasn't a lot of that going on. Now, um, I used to hang out in the same spots that the guys did who were ha- making black exploitation films. So I'd be hanging out, and you knew Jim Brown and Fred Williamson would be at the top. Well, they'd be at the <laughs> upper deck wherever you are, you know, the upper, and then there's, there's a bunch of cats who were working on films that you're familiar with, whether it's Good Pam Greer, whether it's Dolomite, whatever. So it was a lot of fun, but you have to eat. And yeah. what I was able to do is put gas in my tank, pay my rent, you know, and, you know, move forward in my life that way because I refuse to continue submitting scripts to wait for somebody to tell me that I could work. Yeah. I wanted to work because I wasn't trying to be famous. I wasn't interested in Hollywood as much as I was interested in craft. I really liked just filmmaking. I liked yeah. storytelling. And so my objective was not to be famous or in the bright lights, it was to work, get paid, and live a decent life and like what I do. I, I hear that. And I think, you know, when we're pursuing something that's creative and there's an industry that we're really interested in, like, I, I remember just different groups by virtue of putting myself out there. It's like opportunities that present themselves. And I'm like, hey, I'm a podcast nerd. I just like recording conversations and having good conversations and directing the conversation. Like, I don't know if what I do per se is is storytelling. I think what I do is facilitate storytelling. I think I try to provide a framework or what have you. And what we get is what we get. And that that's that's the thing of it. And I also use like doing these sort of interviews as anybody that's listening. You should learn more about this person. This is just a, a sample of it and through through what I may find interesting or have you. But yeah, if someone was like, you know, what if you were making this or what if you were doing that, making this much money, are you going to be super famous from this and so on? Eh, not really interested in it because I think there are parts of it that what that could look like that would make me not like the actual creativity part of it now. And that's the thing. It's like a trade off. I think that's always what it is. We're making deals. You know, it's like, do you want to be this? No, kind of just want to sit here and record. Like when I, when I started off, I just used it as an excuse to talk with my friends about movies and about pop culture. And it's not that anymore, but I'm still uh, equipped to do, and I still do a movie review podcast, which satiates that sort of like desire. And it sticks with the whole reason I got into it. Like this is a piece of it and being able to have interesting conversations. And as I said earlier, I'm a gentleman thief. I'm stealing from people that I'm doing these <laughs> interviews with, but, um, being able to still be tapped in and like, you know, you know, satiate this sort of curiosity and this sort of passion. That's what's interesting to me. So if someone approaches me because my background is in marketing. Someone approaches me. Hey, you can scale it this way. I don't want to scale. I'm good. I'm good with doing things the way that I want and doing it in a way that what, what someone might call scaling is just like, I think the conversation should be inclusive of this as well. That's what my version of scaling is, I guess. Yeah. But still rooted in, it's very similar. It's like, I just want to do this. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Exactly. And, and eventually, um, um, uh, I, you know, I produced Northrop's news show for years. It was called In Touch with Northrop. And so that was a monthly newscast I had to produce and do something. But you got to do so much and you had to shoot, you had to cut, you had to yeah. produce. It was a great place just to learn craft. And yeah. I had some really good filmmakers around me. And, and being in LA, when you needed to contract out a DP or, or, or people who to uh, assist in, in whatever you were working on, these guys were, were, you know, union guys working on your, or who come and work on your film. They'd be working on a major feature one weekend because they had to pay their bills, you know? So you were working with top talent, you know, a lot of the time. And, um, um, I'll never forget. I made a film with a narrative film with Dennis Haysbert. If a lot of people won't recognize him, but some will. He's the Allstate guy. If you can't really. I, I was going to say in, um, what is it? Major League? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Baltimore yeah, movies. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I made a film with Dennis Haysbert and I'll never forget it. It was on ethics 
and uh, I had work with a guy with some of the team, including a guy named Chuck Browse on our team at, at, at Northrop. And I wrote the script. It was approved at the highest levels and shot it. I rented a Ferrari for you know first part of the scenario, and <laughs> we finished the film. <laughs> and we were told, "Uh oh, you guys really messed up." I said, well, "What's wrong?" We did a film on ethics, and we featured you know the I guess the antagonist was driving a red Ferrari, and at the time we didn't know that one of the top CEOs was driving a red Ferrari. Oh, no. <laughs> I mean, the top, you know, brass, you know, and so, you know, that film kind of like, those are the kinds of things, lessons you learn about client-driven media, you know, and that's what corporate is. You're always working in conjunction with a public relations component of a corporation. In, our, in this case, these are Fortune 250s, or you're working with even the outside um company that's handling the broadcast commercials, you know, that part of it that um, involves um, television and uh, and all that. But eventually, TRW Space and Defense um, recruited me from Northrop, yeah. and that's where I got introduced to animation early on in age, because you can't put cameras on spacecraft, you have to do everything. That makes sense. And it's all, you know, a lot of the animation that we we love today the CIG. It's trickled down from DOD, Department of Defense. The Department of Defense huh. is so huge compared to Hollywood entertainment. You know, that technology comes from somewhere. It doesn't all come from university labs or from somebody in Hollywood. It's, it's a trickle down that sort makes of sense. thing, you know? It's just like JPL, you know, Jet Propulsion Laboratory. You see those wonderful visualizations of what, you know, um, where a spacecraft is and how it looks. And we have more data now to be able to construct those, those visualizations as with more accuracy as time goes on. But, um, it's amazing the technologies that are involved in, in doing that kind of work. And that's what TR, the TRW was automotive. It was space. It was a different part of, of what was California at the time, what was yeah. California as, as what we call aerospace and, and, and science, you know, science and technology. So it was just a, a wonderful time to have those opportunities. And eventually North bought TRW, yeah. you know. Yeah, it's, it's great to kind of like see sort of this, I guess, like when, when someone thinks of film, storytelling, screenwriting, animation, that sort of background and hearing like, so flights, <laughs> Northern, like these, yeah. these companies that, that laid sort of the foundation of how I, so that it's, it's great to hear that it's it, and it. And I think it, it shifts me into thinking about this and being in this sort of stage where you're, you're still doing work, but also you're in this spot where you're helping sort of this next generation. So let's, let's talk about uh, Swan and um, a bit about the mission. And I got a litany of bullet points under there, but I at least want to start off there. SWAN, uh, the screenwriting and animation program, was Morgan State University's first interdisciplinary program. Really? The first one, yes. Huh. Approved by MHEC, the Maryland Higher Education Commission. And the reason why SWAN was formed in this manner, and I'm the founding director of SWAN, but part of it came from my discussions with the faculty who came on board and my own experience of um, how do we create sustainable careers from what is a contractually driven business? Yeah. Okay. And so, um, you know, from my experience, you know, in the various industries I've been, and eventually I went into syndicated TV after doing the corporate stuff. But from my experiences, um, I knew that a lot of what we teach in film is transferable tech. It's stuff that all industries value, yeah. especially today where so much is visual and we you know visual storytelling is the dominant storytelling form of the 21st century. So, so, but even data entry coding, all that stuff, you know, we, we, we brush up against that or do it in film. So it was kind of a no brainer to me that we would integrate, you know, gateway computer science courses that other people didn't have to take unless they were computer science majors into, into the SWAN program. And um, uh, Google engineers were beginning to teach those classes at that time here at Morgan. 
And the students didn't like it. Many of them didn't because first it was C plus plus, you know, they had to learn different and then it became Python later. But the value added was that it made people less afraid of dealing with problem solving as it relates to technology. Yeah. And, um, and there's nothing wrong with having on your resume that you have some skill sets that include Python coding, you know, or these other skill sets. It doesn't that hurt. Come. It doesn't hurt. <laughs> it does not hurt. And you, it, the main thing is you can't be afraid. And as uh, things become more open source in film and people are playing around with different things, it's good for you to have a background like that. I mean, we use proprietary programs mainly, but if you want to go outside that paradigm and you want to do some other things, you know, it's nice not to be afraid to play around with it, you know? Yeah. I think like it's, there are times where when people ask me, like, so you have a background in data and data analysis and all of that or data or, and you've been a podcaster as long as you have. And it's like, so where do those two things meet? You're, you're using different parts of your brain. I was like, I think they work together. And I've been in both fields, like almost concurrently. So there's the sort of anecdotal side, you know, doing the storytelling, doing the podcast, on the interviews. And then there's the analytical side that I can maybe flesh out some of the, the stuff when it comes to, Hey, you know, write this narrative based on this data. Boom. Or on the other side of, if I'm talking to a funder, and it's like, so what are your analytics? Well, it just so happens I ran the SQL script that does it every week. And then here's my numbers. And I think those things run together. But also the key thing that comes out of it is the, the, the changing how I think. Yeah, I think in going through this process of doing so many interviews and having a system in place, thinking systematically, that's what I've gotten out of it. And it's allowed me to be, you know, successful, I, I suppose, in, in doing this like amount of work and, and being able to balance these different things. That's right. That's right. That's so true. Um, versatility is really important to uh, sustainability mm -hmm. of a career. Um, I think we do a good job here in the SWAN program of, uh, uh, exposing our students to the notion that you may have a job that's different from your, your creative aspirations. Yeah. But neither, although neither the two shall meet, maybe, um, both must move forward, you know, particularly your creative aspirations, because basically a lot of our students are holding down jobs so that they can just live a life, pay for stuff, including equipment, including computers, so that they can become more practiced at what they most desire to do. And so what we were determined, particularly this is a historically black college and university, and, and one of the things that I think we were determined to do is to look out for the futures of these students as it relates to dreaming and practice. And, you know, dreaming is one thing, practice is another. But to dream and practice together is the best way forward. Yeah. You know, you have to put the time in. But you also need to be able to sustain your life. And not everybody's going to want to live at home, you know, or can live at home. Sure. I always kind of joked around, you know, more joke around. how can you play a living in, <laughs> living at home? But anyway, that, 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 that's just a joke. But anyway, really um, funny, um, and, but, 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 you know, I mean, and, and we know that these days it's very difficult. I have a great deal of empathy for my students. They've dealt with a lot of things that I didn't have to deal with. Yeah. And I feel like it's my responsibility to, keep that in mind in the way that we shape our pedagogy and our curriculum for them to be competitive. And yet, uh, you know, there's this humanistic side of that side of things that we always have to keep in mind, you know, and, uh, and the pressures that students face, you know, and social media mm -hmm. from to, to God knows, you know, the cost of things. And, um, uh, we create an environment here, though, where we address those things, as does Morgan State University, I think, overall, you know, and uh, um, I feel like um, our our faculty and our staff, we are all kind of like uh, 
very much aware of that. And, and, and we've had great success with the growth of the program. And, um, uh, our alumni have, uh, started to, you know, move forward in, in careers in ways that we didn't anticipate to come even this soon, you know. We have three concentrations in SWAN or screenwriting and animation. We have film and TV writing, and that's where a lot of our, our filmmakers are because we have the same production building blocks curriculum that any film school does. You know, you have to make films here, you have to cut, you even have to do animation. We introduce you to all of that, but we're called film and TV writing is our most popular concentration. We also have computer animation, which is growing. It's becoming equal in popularity to film and TV writing. We may overtake it because it includes a game design component as well as, you know, filmmaking, etc. And we have a third component and it's, we call it screenwriting and animation, but when you put these things into, um, how should I say, the academic approval cycle for people who don't understand film, mm -hmm. things will spit back out. Like, so that third concentration is called integrated media writing and, and, uh, animation. Yeah. We call it screenwriting and animation to keep it short, you know, but that brings in the graphic comics as well as graphic novels and, and require students in addition to taking the eight credits of computer science that all of our students must take, which are some of the same gateway courses that computer science majors have to take. It requires them to take drawing classes in the art department and fine arts. So we, we give up in that major, we're, we're giving up 14 credits so that they can experience those fundamentals mm -hmm. in those other areas because that's what an interdisciplinary major does, you know. We're not trying to recreate all the skill sets, the base for the skill sets in art, but we, we know what we do, what we're here to do, and if we can find it somewhere else, we're going to talk to that program. And that's what collaboration and, and, and interdisciplinary efforts are all about. It makes for a more well-rounded, professional, creative, whatever the terminology would be, when it goes to that sort of next level. and. Going back to one of the things you said, and we got like probably two more real questions here. Um, you know, I, I just remember like, you know, having that desire, I want to say maybe two years into the real career. And it's like, all right, I need this job, you know, to, to, to do this and all of that different stuff to pay for my lifestyle and living. I enjoy my bagels or whatever the thing might be. Right. And, and I just remember being like 24. And this is around that time. That's, it says right down on mine, being 24, I was on my birthday and I was talking with some friends and I was like, I'm feeling creatively like stifled, like trying to find different opportunities. I, I was a marketing analyst. Not like a marketer, but marketing analyst. I'm doing all the ROI stuff. And I was just reaching for opportunities to do something sexy, to do something that was fun, whether it be training videos and make them interesting, whether it be filming like our holiday party and doing some of these creative, uh, these sort of create, these sort of structured, um, things in there that were sales, incentive sales boosting, just different programming ultimately that I could flex sort of that creative muscle. And podcasting was not a part of it at all at the time. And, you know, just trying to figure it out, trying to figure out like, this is what I really want to do. This is what's paying me. And finding now that both of those things over the years have come closer and closer together. And, you know, I just take something from it. I just take something from it that makes it work better. Like there's always this conversation when it comes to like artists and uh, like, like people who are in business that they don't have those sort of complementary skills. Like artists don't know how to do their taxes or have their, their stuff together in that regard. And obviously it's not all, but that's kind of the, the idea that floats around. And I, I think having that sort of that foundation and starting off as a person who I wanted to be a comic book writer. Yeah, that's what I wanted. I was drawing comics and all this. We'll talk about that later. And, and returning to sort of like this creative thing, like trying to, um, on my own, own, own interest, trying writing, writing poetry, writing short stories, things of that nature, and then maybe write a few treatments here and there and trying to figure out like, what is the lane that that's calling me while having this sort of creative, I mean, this sort of professional backdrop 
you know, being here, writing like rap and like short stories while in the business program and just having that sort of here's the creative thing that you want to do. But here's the professional thing that you're going to do. You could either fall back on. So almost being in a spot where I can be my own agent or I am able to be more knowledgeable in a conversation to be able to speak for both sides, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, that, you're absolutely right. Um, I was going to say one of the things that we've had success with here as well, we have a lot of partners. Mm. We have a lot of people we collaborate with. Um, um, we have a what's called a Swan Visiting Artist Program. And we just had David Talbert in, for instance, uh, yeah. who did a screening of Jingle Jangle, his $100 million Evergreen Christmas film for Netflix, which is a landmark film. Yeah. In fact, I think it was featured in CNN, 50 Greatest Christmas Movies, you know, and um, to, you know, people like Nina Noble and David Simon, who have actually brought post-production on uh, Show Me a Hero to this very, you know, facility and lived with us for three weeks with the writers and producers and allowed my students to see a process, deadline-driven process in real time. I mean, these... Blown deadline. <laughs> they, yeah, but, yeah, blown deadline. And, and um, 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 but that's what, this is immersion, you know yeah. what I mean? And and uh, we work with Johns Hopkins, Baltimore Youth Film Arts, uh, Lucy Bucknell, Lucy, um, Chrissy Fitzgerald. We work with the South Saints Innovation Film, Annette Porter, uh, we work with a lot, we have a lot of different partners, uh, Baltimore Office of Promotion and the Arts. We're the co-founder of the Baltimore Screenwriting Contest. Oh, wow. And so Debbie Dorsey is, is, is a regular, you know, partner to what we do. Then that contest is, I think it's reaching 20 years now. But anyway, um, partnerships are absolutely essential. Here was one of the most extraordinary things that happened to us within the past, I'd say four years is or three years is that uh Timothy Ware Hill wrote a uh, spoken voice tribute to Ar Armit Aubrey who was killed in Georgia, tragically killed in Georgia. And Arnon Manor, a VP at Sony Animation, saw the piece and he has his own company, Critical Films. And they decided to do a mixed media animation piece with that uh with Timothy Ware Hill's um you know, a spoken word piece as the backdrop. And sure enough, it was just so just out of the blue, you know, I get a call and they're calling us to see if we want to join, uh, you know, 15 other animators, some of who are at the top of the game, including some, the, you know, a school in Canada sure. uh, to work on this project. And uh, it was going to be, you know, this animation uh, uh, called Cops and Robbers. And we jumped in there. My students got to work on that. And these guys, it was a regular process, you know, development process. It was so cool. But anyway, long story short, the piece went on to win the Peabody for social justice. Wow. It's on Netflix. It's called Cops and Robbers, Statement and Mixed Man Animation. So, so, uh, then, uh, Matt, uh, uh, Arnie Manor, uh, and decides to, what Timothy Ware Hill decides to donate $20,000 to Morgan to create a Channing Heart Scholarship. So we have this rotating scholarship as of 22, or 20, 21, I think, or 22, 22, that students create um, a social justice piece, whether it's written, whether it's produced, or whether it's animation, whatever. And they compete to get one of these thousand dollar scholarships. Okay. But just having people like at that level involved with your students who are regularly zooming in to mm -hmm. talk to them is just, it energizes you and it shows them the possibilities and pathways. The same thing we have with uh, Netflix animation studios. They're now, they've come on the ground and yeah. visited us and, uh, now Sony animation and, um, we, you know, we have students now working at Disney in Los Angeles. We have students at DreamWorks in Los Angeles. Um, we have students who are independently kind of, uh, coming up as artists, animators and artists like Kyle Yearwood. He just worked on a real cool piece that's on the Smithsonian, 
uh, channel called Afrofuturism, the origin. All of that animation and that conceptualization comes from Kyle Yearwood. And um, it's just so satisfying to see people breaking through like that. Taurus Thomas won the top funding from the South Saints uh, Fund to make his film Senior, yeah. which we turned into an immersive experience for Swan by working with him in Baltimore over that 13-day period wow. on the film. And um, um, he uh, is part of our team here, too. And um, uh, we just have had the fortune of people who want to give back, who are moving forward. And whenever we can, through internships, through these immersive experiences, as we call them, we involve our students. And, and, and um, I'm sure there's people I'm not mentioning who I should, forgive me for that, but, or, or companies. Uh, but um, this is uh, very important yeah. to, uh, you know, uh, any type of film program or expressive arts program. You need to have successful practitioners kind of, you know, be involved in helping show your students the way. Uh, we're now doing a, a short film on um, our student. We have a beachhead in Los Angeles now, so we're doing a short film about all of our guys that have come from Swan who have popped up in L.A. and are working there now. Okay. We have people in New York and um, um, just the alumni, you know, um, uh, desire to give back to the program has been really incredible. Um, um, we, um, we, we look forward to the fellow, to the further development of our program and hopefully, you know, to the development of facilities that, um, that we have the fortune to even already own to be part of this, you know, this effort. That is, that is just, I'm in awe and I just see, Hearing collaboration and hearing that it's just, I have, the, the, the hamster wheel is going right now. So yeah, but I, but I think that we have everything as far as the main questions. Um, yeah. so I want to hit you with three rapid fire questions. Oh, okay. Cause everybody gets a rapid fire. Questions. No, okay. Okay. All right. So can don't I, overthink them. Can I curse? <laughs> that, see, that's a question for me now playing. somehow. <laughs> so here's, here's the first one. Yeah. Uh, when you're getting work done, whatever the work might be. Yeah. When when do you get your best work done? Is it morning? Is it evening? When are you getting your best? When are you most optimal in terms of your your working style? That's very very interesting question. Um, I have had to learn to be effective in whatever time frame that it's the nature of business. <laughs> I find myself able to focus in on on, yeah. on those things that require the most attention, particularly conceptualization of pedagogy and curriculum, studying uh, where our program should be headed in the way of preparing people for the future. And my own creative work suffers the most, but I've even learned to make space for that in the bits and pieces that I throw at that from time to time, but I've, I'm fully dedicated to uh, whatever effort that I have for whatever time frame I'm given. And uh, a lot of the time, I won't even lie, caffeine plays a big role. In- <laughs> As we're both enjoying coffees right now, so I hear you. I hear you. Yeah, I, you know, like, I uh, talk with my partner on occasion about, like, you know, she she's a writer, and she's like, yeah, I just want to have time to write and the time to... It's like, you know, I, 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 I steal, I juggle, I juggle time. Um, it, you know, might stack things and being fortunate enough to do kind of a double dip here of this is a, a studio visit or a space visit and an interview. So it's kind of knocked out two, two different things. There's fellowship and there's collaboration in there. And there's also the sort of content component there. So being able to figure it out, cause you try to have, you know, time blocked out in this way. It's like maximizing that, that sort of effort. At least that's the, the thinking that I have there. But yeah, I, I think I agree where, you know, that's especially coming back from a place that had a different time zone, you know, it's like, uh, I'm thrown off a little bit. So it's like, let me just, time is fake, you know? Yeah. Well, you, well, you know, the other plus I was, oh, I'll add this real quickly. I know yeah. you. Um, I have wonderful colleagues here who are dealing with the same thing. Uh, 
David Warfield is one of my, my colleagues here on faculty, produced a micro-budget film, Rolls, a few years back. And it was shot with a 5D camera. It looks beautiful. It looks like, you know, it's on the Apple Entertainment. And uh, so, and I've got people like Dale Baran, the coordinator of animation, who's constantly working on stuff. And, and you're moving that. And then I have MK Asante as a colleague. And I've actually watched MK develop whole books <laughs> and storyboards simultaneously looking forward to what if this becomes a movie and to do that integrating it yeah he's sure he's got time in a room alone and all that but you have time where you're not in a room alone where you're still moving that forward mm-hmm. you understand and um so you know i have people around me i have david roberts who's a faculty member of one of my former students who runs a a company and is to uh, you know brings a lot of opportunities to our students and he makes he client driven media is very successful at it, but he's making an independent film, micro budget film simultaneously, you know. And, and so there's no, and raising a family. My kids are grown. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. it's, it's, yeah. it's sort of that. And, and that makes a lot of sense. Um, so I have, I have two. And this, this next one definitely relates. Yeah. How many hours of sleep do you get on average? My doctor wants me to get seven at least. And um, I've had to pay more attention to yeah. my, my, you know, the suggestions that my, my, my Hopkins medical team gives me, and, and than ever. But throughout, you know, it's not unusual for me to get up at four a.m. after four or five hours of sleep, Oof. and I try to exercise, you know, in the morning. But I'm trying to get seven hours of sleep, but I don't go to bed early. So, it, and then I have to get up early. So for me to get seven, I've got to sacrifice something. You know what I mean? And, um, um, rather than, and the idea is, of course, you need to sacrifice something in that way so that you don't sacrifice yourself. Mm-hmm. But, um, uh, um, the energy from being in this career over this period of time, uh, you know, it's like, We've always had these brutal hours. I still work 12. I was here for 12 hours, 14 hours almost yesterday. Now. And I don't, I'm not proud of that, but you do, sometimes that happens, you know? Uh, but, um, I, I think we developed those habits from early on because yeah. of the nature of well, our enterprise. Yeah. You're, you're, I, I, I spoke with someone, um, I was telling you a little bit about early, just different jobs. And, you know, it's just saying like, when, once I get hooked on something, you know, like, let's say solving an issue in a data problem. Mm-hmm. There've been times where I would just forget. It's like, Oh, it was light outside. Now it's, it's 12 o'clock. It's midnight. Yeah. Why am I still in the office? And yeah. it's just, I'm in, in it. And, you know, I find like sometimes, um, you know, at a point I had this heavy point where I was, I did 18 interviews in a week. Yeah. And it's like, it's a lot. Cause it's not just, and, and it's like the menu thing, right? Yeah. You see yeah. what's on the menu, you see the dish, but you're not yeah. seeing what goes into it. So yeah. when that thing goes up, cause oil goes up, <laughs> You know, like when I'm putting in two or three hours of prep before an interview, you know, to get it kind of ready, it's like I'm putting in 54 hours if I'm doing 18 interviews, you know, one for the interview and two or so for the prep work. And luckily I have an an editor that I'm not putting in another two hours, but that's not like you're saying, you said it so well that you're kind of like you're you're giving up something. It's it's yourself. You're giving Yeah, you're giving up something. And I'm, I'm fortunate at this point in the development of Swan. Uh, because for so many years I didn't have a, have too much of a staff. And now I've got a wonderful, young, bright, two full-time staff members, which is a big deal. Yeah. I've got part-time players for the lab. And, and once again, I've got an alumni who's my lab manager who has another total job in that field as a SIMTI engineer who's giving back to us. I mean, he's paid, but these are the quality of people that, that are now part of the team. And it, it, ma- it makes it better for me. But you know, you face the same challenge. I mean, when are you going to read? When are you going to watch the movies we want to watch? Yes. You know what I mean? So, and, and when are you going to live your life? So you're integrating your life. And that's something we talk about a lot in our program yeah. is about managing your life in this expressive arts lane, you know? Yeah. It's, um, I find like, you know, for me, I, one of the things I'm able to do is get very creative in how I consume. I'm not a person that is going to like, it's rare, rare occasions that I'm going to dive into and pull out a book 
but am, do I have 200 plus audiobooks on my phone? Sure. Yes. Yeah. And that, that's, that's how I consume sure. it. And, sure. but you know, certain things like, I watch movies a lot differently now because of the movie podcast that I yeah, do. And yeah. I'm thinking about it critically. We have this, this is an aside and I have the one last question for you, but there, there's a thing, like, I don't know if you follow like, um, uh, soccer or what have you, but you know how do you have the stoppage play? Yeah. We do that with movies. So for a two hour movie, it might take us three hours to watch it. Cause it's like, <laughs> yo, did that just happen? I do the same thing. I do the same thing. I do the same thing. We did I, that a I, lot with Tar recently. Uh, okay. Okay. I, 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 uh, yeah, I understand. <laughs> So, so this is the last one, yeah. and I think you're going to enjoy this question a lot. Uh, what is your favorite four-letter word that starts with an F? <laughs> you can take it one or two ways. It might be a trap I'm setting. Who knows? <laughs> Let me think about this for a minute. <laughs> uh. Yeah. Well, you know the word. Film. <laughs> Film. Exactly. Yeah. So exactly. So that's exactly. Although there's know, another one. <laughs> there is another one that's used frequently in the making of film. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Find. Uh, uh, so I wanna I wanna thank you for coming on to this podcast. This has been truly a treat and truly a um Great opportunity. And uh, for, for those not here, uh, Keith has had me check out the space, uh, speak with students and just really afforded me that that space and opportunity and really a welcome return to to the campus and a very great conversation to have. So thank you um, so much. And I want to invite and encourage you to tell folks listening where they can learn more about Swan, learn more about you, the floor, whatever you want to say. The floor is yours. Uh, Swan has an Instagram presence, uh, screenwriting and animation at Morgan State University. We are on the Morgan website as Swan or screenwriting and animation under the Gilliam College of Liberal Arts. That's our home. And, um, we also have a presence on Facebook and, um, we welcome you to, uh, join our growing number of followers and uh, um, look for us um, also on YouTube in the future and uh, on Vimeo as well. Well, there you have it, folks. I want to again thank uh, Keith Mellinger for coming on to the podcast and chopping it up with me. And I'm Rob Lees, and there's art, culture, filmmakers, storytellers in and around your neck of the woods. You just got to look for them.